Greetings, sons and daughters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has loved us, in peace. Seeing that the divine fruits of righteousness abound among you, I rejoice exceedingly and above measure over your happy and honored spirits, because you have with such effect received the engrafted spiritual gift. Therefore I, who also am hoping to be saved, congratulate myself all the more because I truly perceive in you the Spirit poured forth from the rich Lord of love. How overwhelmed I was on your account by the long-desired sight of you. Being convinced of this, therefore, and conscious of the fact that I said many things in your midst, I know that the Lord has accompanied me in the way of righteousness. Above all, I too am compelled to do this, to love you more than my own soul, because great faith and love dwell in you through the hope of his life. Considering this, therefore, that if I should take the trouble to communicate to you some portion of what I have myself received, it will prove to me a sufficient reward that I minister to such spirits. I have hastened to send you a brief note, in order that along with your faith you might have perfect knowledge. There are three basic doctrines of the Lord. The hope of life, which is the beginning and end of our faith, and righteousness, which is the beginning and end of judgment, and a glad and rejoicing love, which is the testimony of works of righteousness. For the Master has made known to us by the prophets both the things which are past and present, and has given to us a foretaste of things to come. Consequently, when we see these things come to pass, one thing after the other, just as he predicted, we ought to make a richer and loftier offering out of reverence for him. For my part, not as a teacher, but as one of you, I will point out a few things that will cheer you up in the present circumstances. Inasmuch as the days are evil and Satan possesses the power of this world, we ought to be on our guard and seek out the righteous requirements of the Master. Our faith's helpers, then, are fear and patience, and our allies are endurance and self-control. When these things persist in purity in matters relating to the Lord, wisdom, understanding, insight, and knowledge rejoice along with them. For he has made it clear to us by all the prophets that he needs neither sacrifices nor burnt offerings nor oblations, saying on one occasion, What is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I am full of burnt offerings, and I do not want the fat of lambs and the blood of bulls and goats, not when you come to appear before me. For who has demanded these things from your hands? Do not continue to trample my court. If you bring with you fine flour, it is vain. Incense is an abomination to me, and your new moons and Sabbaths I cannot stand. Therefore he has abolished these things, in order that the new law of our Master, Jesus Christ, which is free from the yoke of compulsion, might have its offering, one not made by humans. And again he says to them, I did not command your fathers, when they went out from the land of Egypt to offer me burnt offerings and sacrifices, did I? On the contrary, this is what I commanded them. Let none of you bear a grudge in his heart against his neighbor, and do not love a false oath. We ought to perceive, therefore, since we are not without understanding, the gracious intention of our Father, because he is speaking to us. He wants us to seek how we may approach him, rather than go astray as they did. To us, then, he declares, A sacrifice to God is a broken heart. An aroma pleasing to the Lord is a heart that glorifies its Maker. So, brothers, we ought to give very careful attention to our salvation, lest the evil one should cause some error to slip into our midst, and thereby hurl us away from our life. He speaks to them again concerning these things. Why do you fast for me, says the Lord, so that today your voice should be heard crying loudly? This is not the fast I have chosen, says the Lord, not a man humiliating his soul. Even if you bend your neck into a circle and put on sackcloth and ashes, not even then will you call it an acceptable fast. But to us, he says, Behold, this is the fast that I have chosen, says the Lord. Break every unjust bond, untie the knots of forced agreements, set free those that are oppressed, and tear up every unjust contract. Share your bread with the hungry, clothe the naked when you see him, bring the homeless into your house, and if you see someone of lowly status, do not despise that person, nor shall the members of your house or family do so. Then your light will break forth early like the dawn and your healing will spring quickly, and righteousness shall go forth before you, 
and the glory of God will surround you. Then you will call, and God will hear you. While you are still speaking, he will say, Here I am. If you rid yourself of oppression, the pointing of the finger, and words of complaint, and give your bread to the hungry from the heart, and show mercy to the soul that has been humbled. So for this reason, brothers, the one who is very patient, when he foresaw how the people whom he had prepared in his beloved would believe in all purity, revealed everything to us in advance, in order that we might not shipwreck ourselves as proselytes to their law. We must therefore investigate the present circumstances very carefully, and seek out the things that are able to save us. Let us therefore absolutely avoid the works of lawlessness, lest the works of lawlessness overpower us. And let us hate the deception of the present age, so that we may be loved in the age to come. Let us give no relaxation to our soul, because relaxation gives it liberty to associate with sinners and wicked men, lest we become like them. The final stumbling block approaches, concerning which the scriptures speak as Enoch says. For the Master has cut short the times and the days for this reason, that his beloved might make haste and come into his inheritance. And the prophet also says, Ten kingdoms will reign over the earth, and after them a little king will rise up, who will subdue three of the kings with a single blow. Similarly, Daniel says, concerning the same one, And I saw the fourth beast, wicked and powerful, and more savage than all the beasts of the earth, and how ten horns sprang up from it, and from these a little offshoot of a horn, and how it subdued three of the large horns with a single blow. You ought, therefore, to understand. And this also I further beg of you, as being one of you, and loving you both individually and collectively more than my own soul, to be on your guard now, and do not be like certain people. That is, do not continue to pile up your sins while claiming. Our covenant remains valid. In truth, those people lost it completely in the following way, when Moses had just received it. For the scripture says, And Moses was on the mountain fasting for forty days and forty nights and he received the covenant from the Lord, stone tablets written with the finger of the hand of the Lord. But turning away to idols, they lost it. For the Lord speaks to Moses, 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 go down quickly, because your people, whom you led out of the land of Egypt, have broken the law. And Moses understood and hurled the two tablets from his hands, and their covenant was shattered, in order that the covenant of the beloved Jesus might be sealed in our heart in the hope which flows from having faith in him. Though I would like to write a great deal more, not as a teacher, but as befits one who does not like to leave out anything we possess. Nevertheless, I hasten to move along, being your devoted slave. Consequently, let us be on guard in the last days, for the whole time of our faith will do us no good unless now, in the age of lawlessness, we offer resistance, as befits God's children and likewise to the coming stumbling blocks, so that the black one may not find an opportunity to sneak in. Let us flee from every kind of vanity. Let us utterly hate the works of the evil way. Do not withdraw within yourselves and live alone, as though you were already justified. But gather together in one place, and make common inquiry concerning what tends to your general welfare. For the scripture says, Woe to them who are wise in their own opinion, and clever in their own sight. Let us become spiritual. Let us become a perfect temple for God. To the best of our ability, let us meditate upon the fear of God, and let us keep His commandments, so that we may rejoice in His ordinances. The Lord will judge the world without partiality. Every man will receive as he has done. If he is righteous, his righteousness will precede him. If he is wicked, the wages of wickedness are before him. Let us never fall asleep in our sins, as if being called were an excuse to rest lest the evil ruler gain power over us and thrust us out of the kingdom of the Lord. Moreover, consider this as well, my brothers. When you see that after such extraordinary signs and wonders were done in Israel, they were still abandoned. Let us be on guard, lest we be found to fulfill that saying, Many are called, but few are chosen. It was for this reason that the Lord endured the deliverance of his flesh to corruption, so that we might be cleansed by the forgiveness of sins that is, by his sprinkled blood. For the scripture concerning him relates partly to Israel and partly to us, and says as follows, He was wounded because of our transgressions, and has been afflicted because of our sins. By his wounds we are healed.
Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb he was silent before his shearer. Therefore we ought to be deeply grateful to the Master, because he has both made known to us the past, and given us wisdom in the present circumstance, and has not left us without understanding in regard to the things which are to come. Now the Scripture says, Not unjustly are nets spread out for the birds. This means that men deserve to perish if, having knowledge of the way of righteousness, they ensnare themselves in the way of darkness. And furthermore, my brothers, if the Lord endured to suffer for our souls, even though He is Lord of the whole world, to whom God said at the foundation of the world, Let us make man in our image and likeness. How is it then that He submitted to suffer at the hand of men? Learn. The prophets, having obtained grace from Him, prophesied about Him. But he himself submitted in order that he might destroy death and demonstrate the reality of the resurrection of the dead because it was necessary that he be manifested in the flesh. Also, he submitted in order that he might redeem the promise to the fathers and, while preparing the new people for himself, prove, while he was still on earth, that after he has brought about the resurrection, he will execute judgment. Furthermore, by teaching Israel, and performing extraordinary wonders and signs, he preached and loved them intensely. And when he chose his own apostles who were destined to preach his gospel, who were sinful beyond all measure in order that he might demonstrate that he did not come to call the righteous, but sinners, then he revealed himself to be God's Son. For if he had not come in the flesh, then men would have never looked upon him and been saved. For when they look upon the Son, which will eventually cease to be and is the very work of his own hands, they cannot face its rays. The Son of God therefore came in the flesh for this reason, that he might complete the full measure of the sins of those who persecuted his prophets to death. It was for this reason then that he endured. For God says that the wounds of his flesh came from them. When they strike down their own shepherd, then the sheep of the flock will be lost. But he himself desired to suffer in this manner for it was necessary that he should suffer on the tree. For the one who prophesies says concerning him, Spare my soul from the sword, and pierce my flesh with nails, for bands of wicked men have risen up against me. And again he says, Behold, I have given my back to scourges, and my cheeks to blows, and I have set my face like a solid rock. Therefore, when he gave the commandment, what did he say? Who is the one who condemns me? Let him oppose me, or who is the one who vindicates himself against me? Let him draw near to the servant of the Lord. Woe to you, because you will all grow old like a garment, and the moth will devour you. And again the prophet says, Since he was set in place like a mighty stone that crushes, Behold, I will set into the foundations of Zion a precious stone, especially chosen, a cornerstone, highly valued. Then what does he say? And he who sets his hope on him will live forever. Does our hope then rest on a rock? By no means. But he says this because the Lord has established his flesh in strength. For he says, And he established me as a solid rock. And the prophet says again, The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And again he says, This is the great and wonderful day that the Lord has made. I'm writing very simply so that you may understand. I, the devoted slave of your love, what then does the prophet again say? A band of evil men have surrounded me. They have swarmed around me like bees around a honeycomb. And for my garment, they cast lots. Therefore, inasmuch as he was about to be revealed and to suffer in the flesh, his suffering was revealed in advance. For the prophet says concerning Israel, Woe to their soul, because they have plotted an evil plot against themselves by saying, Let us bind the righteous one because he is troublesome to us. What does the other prophet Moses say to them? Behold, thus says the Lord God, Enter into the good land, which the Lord promised by oath to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and take possession of it as an inheritance, a land flowing with milk and honey. But now learn what knowledge has to say. Learn. Set your hope upon him who is about to be revealed to you in the flesh, that is, Jesus. For man is earth in a suffering state, for the formation of Adam was from the face of the earth. What then does into the good land, a land flowing with milk and honey, mean? 
Blessed is our Lord, brothers, who has endowed us with wisdom and understanding of his secrets. For the prophet speaks a parable concerning the Lord. Who can understand it except one who is wise and discerning and loves his Lord? So since he renewed us by the forgiveness of sins, he made us people of another type, so that we should have the soul of children, as if he were creating us all over again. For the scripture speaks about us when he speaks to the Son, Let us make man in our image and likeness, and let them rule over the beasts of the earth, and the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea. And when he saw that our creation was good, the Lord said, Increase and multiply and fill the earth. These things he said to the Son. Again, I will show you how the Lord speaks to us. He made a second creation in the last days. The Lord says, Behold, I make the last things as the first. It was with reference to this, therefore, that the prophet proclaimed, Enter into the land flowing with milk and honey, and rule over it. Observe, then, that we have been created anew, just as he says once more in another prophet, Behold, says the Lord, I will take away from these, that is to say, from those whom the Spirit of the Lord foresaw, their stony hearts, and put in hearts of flesh, because he was about to be manifested in the flesh, and to dwell in us. For the dwelling place of our heart, my brothers, is a holy temple dedicated to the Lord. For the Lord says again, And with what shall I appear before the Lord my God and be glorified? I will confess you in the congregation of my brothers, and I will sing to you in the midst of the congregation of the saints. Therefore we are the ones whom he brought into the good land. So why then does he mention the milk and honey? Because the infant is first nourished with honey, and then with milk. So in a similar manner we too, being nourished by faith in the promise and by the word, will live and rule over the earth. Now we have already said above, and let them increase and multiply and rule over the fish. But who is presently able to rule over beasts or fish or birds of the air? For we ought to realize that to rule implies that one has authority, so that the one giving orders is really in control. If, however, this is not now the case, then he has told us when it will be, when we ourselves have been made perfect and so become heirs of the Lord's covenant. Understand, therefore, children of joy, that the good Lord has revealed everything to us beforehand, so that we might know whom we ought to praise when giving thanks for all things. If, therefore, the Son of God, who is Lord and is destined to judge the living and the dead, suffered in order that his wounds might give us life, let us believe that the Son of God could not suffer except for our sake. But he also was given vinegar and gall to drink when he was crucified. Hear how the priests of the temple have revealed something about this, when the command that, Whoever does not keep the fast shall surely die was written. The Lord commanded it because he himself was planning to offer the vessel of his spirit as a sacrifice for our sins, in order that the type established by Isaac, who was offered upon the altar, might be fulfilled. What therefore does he say in the prophet? And let them eat from the goat that is offered at the fast for all their sins. Pay careful attention. And let all the priests, but only them, eat the unwashed intestines with vinegar. Why? Since you are going to give me, when I am about to offer my flesh for the sins of my new people, gall with vinegar to drink, you alone must eat, while the people fast and lament in sackcloth and ashes. This was to show that he must suffer at their hands. Pay attention to what he commanded. Take two goats, fine and well matched, and offer them and let the priest take one for a whole burnt offering for sins. But what shall they do with the other one? The other one, he says, is cursed. Notice how the type of Jesus is revealed. And all of you shall spit upon it and pierce it, and tie scarlet wool around its head, and then let it be driven out into the wilderness. And when these things have been done, the man in charge of the goat leads it into the wilderness, and he removes the wool and places it upon the bush commonly called Rakia, the buds of which we are accustomed to eat when we find them in the countryside. Only the fruit of the rakia is sweet. What is the meaning of this? Note well. The one is for the altar, and the other is cursed. And note that the one which is cursed is then crowned. For they will see him on that day, wearing a long scarlet robe about his body, and they will say, 
Is this not the one whom we once crucified, insulting and piercing and spitting on him? Surely this was the man who said then that he was the Son of God. Now how is he like that goat? The goats are well matched, fine, and almost identical for this reason, so that when they see him coming then, they may be amazed at the similarity of the goat. Observe, therefore, the type of Jesus who was destined to suffer. And what does it mean when they place the wool in the midst of the thorns? It is a type of Jesus, set forth for the church, because whoever desires to take away the scarlet wool must suffer greatly, since the thorns are so terrible, and can only gain possession of it through affliction. Likewise, he says, Those who desire to see me and to gain my kingdom must receive me through affliction and suffering. Now what type do you think was intended when he commanded Israel that men who are utterly sinful should offer a heifer and slaughter and burn it, and that then the children should take the ashes and place them in containers and tie the scarlet wool around a piece of wood, observe again the type of the cross and the scarlet wool and the hyssop, and that then the children should sprinkle the people one by one in order that they may be purified from their sins. Grasp how plainly he is speaking to you. The calf is Jesus. The sinful men who offer it are those who brought him to the slaughter. Then the men are no more. No more is the glory of sinners. The children who sprinkle are those who preach to us the good news about the forgiveness of sins and the purification of the heart, those to whom he gave the authority to proclaim the gospel. There were twelve of them as a witness to the tribes, because there are twelve tribes of Israel. And why are there three children who sprinkle? as a witness to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because these men were great in God's sight. And then there is the matter of the wool on the piece of wood. This signifies that the kingdom of Jesus is based on the wooden cross, and that those who hope in him will live forever. But why the wool and the hyssop together? Because in his kingdom there will be dark and evil days, in which we will be saved, because the one who suffers in body is healed by means of the dark juice of the hyssop. So therefore the things that happened in this way are clear to us, but to them are quite obscure, because they did not listen to the voice of the Lord. Furthermore, with respect to the ears, he describes how he circumcised our heart. The Lord says in the prophet, As soon as they heard, they obeyed me. And again he says, Those who are far off will hear with their ears, and they will understand what I have done. Also, circumcise your hearts, says the Lord. And again he says, Hear, Israel, for this is what the Lord your God says. And again the Spirit of the Lord prophesies, Who is the one who desires to live forever? With the ear, let him hear the voice of my servant. And again he says, Hear, heaven, and give ear, earth, for the Lord has spoken these things as a testimony. And again he says, Hear, children, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. In short, he circumcised our ears in order that when we hear the word we might believe. But the circumcision in which they have trusted has been abolished, for he declared that circumcision was not a matter of the flesh, but they disobeyed because an evil angel enlightened them. He says to them, This is what the Lord your God says. Here I find a commandment. Do not sow among thorns. Be circumcised to your Lord. And what does he say? Circumcise your hard-heartedness, and stop being stiff-necked. Take this again. Behold, says the Lord, all the nations have uncircumcised foreskins, but these people have an uncircumcised heart. But you will say, but surely the people were circumcised as a seal. But every Syrian and Arab and all the idol-worshipping priests are also circumcised. Does this mean that they too belong to their covenant? Why, even the Egyptians practice circumcision. Learn abundantly, therefore, children of love, about everything. Abraham, who first instituted circumcision, looked forward in the Spirit to Jesus when he circumcised, having received the teaching of the three letters. For it says, And Abraham circumcised ten and eight and three hundred men of his household. What, then, is the knowledge that was given to him? Observe that it mentions the ten and eight first, and then, after an interval, the three hundred. As for the ten and eight, the iota is ten, and the eta is eight. Here you have the initials of the name of Jesus, 
and because the cross, which is shaped like the letter Tau, was destined to convey grace, it also mentions the three hundred. So he reveals Jesus in the two letters, and the cross in the other one. The one who placed within us the implanted gift of his covenant understands. No one has ever learned from me a more reliable word, but I know that you are worthy of it. Now when Moses said, You shall not eat a pig, or an eagle, or a hawk, or a crow, or any fish that has no scales, he received, according to the correct understanding, three precepts. Furthermore, he says to them in Deuteronomy, I will set forth as a covenant to this people my righteous requirements. Therefore it is not God's commandment that they should not eat, rather Moses spoke spiritually. Accordingly he mentioned the pig for this reason. You must not associate, he means, with such people who are like pigs. That is, when they are well off, they forget the Lord, but when they are in need they acknowledge the Lord, just as the pig ignores its owner when it is feeding, but when it is hungry it starts to squeal and falls silent only after being fed again. Neither shall you eat the eagle, or the hawk, or the kite, or the crow. You must not, he means, associate with or even resemble such people, who do not know how to provide food for themselves by labor and sweat, but lawlessly plunder other people's property. Indeed, though they walk about with the appearance of innocence, they are carefully watching and looking around for someone to rob in their greed, just as these birds alone do not provide food for themselves but sit idle and look for ways to eat the flesh of others. They are nothing more than pests in their wickedness. And you shall not eat, he says, sea eel or octopus or cuttlefish. You must not, he means, even resemble such people, who are utterly wicked and are already condemned to death, just as these fish alone are cursed and swim in the depths, not swimming about like the rest, but living in the mud beneath the depths. Furthermore, you shall not eat the hare. Why? Do not become, he means, one who corrupts children, or even resemble such people, because the hare multiplies year by year the places of its conception. For as many years as it lives, so many it has. Again, neither shall you eat the hyena. Do not become, he means, an adulterer, or a seducer, or even resemble such people. Why? Because this animal changes its nature from year to year, and becomes male one time and female another but he has also hated the weasel, and with good reason. Do not become, he means, like those men who, we hear with immoral intent, do things with the mouth that are forbidden, and do not associate with those immoral women who do things with the mouth that are forbidden, for this animal conceives through its mouth. Concerning food, then, Moses received three precepts to this effect and spoke in a spiritual sense, but because of their fleshly desires, the people accepted them as though they referred to actual food. David received knowledge of the same three precepts, and says similarly, Blessed is the man who has not followed the counsel of ungodly men, like the fish that swim about in darkness in the depths, and has not taken the path of sinners, like those who pretend to fear the Lord but sin like pigs, and has not sat in the seat of pestilent men, like the birds that sit waiting for plunder. You now have the full story concerning food. Again, Moses says, Eat anything that has a divided hoof and choose the cud. Why does he say this? Because when it receives food it knows the one who is feeding it, and relying upon that person appears to rejoice. He spoke well with regard to the commandment. What then does he mean? Associate with those who fear the Lord, with those who meditate in their heart on the special significance of the word that they have received, with those who proclaim and obey the Lord's righteous requirements, with those who know that meditation is a labor of joy and who ruminate on the word of the Lord. But why does he mention the divided hoof? Because the righteous person not only lives in this world, but also looks forward to the holy age to come. Observe what a wise lawgiver Moses was. But how could those people grasp or understand these things? But we, however, having rightly understood the commandments, explain them as the Lord intended. He circumcised our ears and hearts for this very purpose, so that we might understand these things. But let us inquire whether the Lord took care to foreshadow the water and the cross. Now concerning the water, it is written with reference to Israel that they would never accept the baptism that brings forgiveness of sins, but would create a substitute for themselves. For the prophet says, Be astonished, heaven, 
and let the earth shudder greatly at this, because this people has done two evil things. They have abandoned me, the fountain of life, and they have dug for themselves a pit of death. Is my holy mountain Sinai a desert rock? For you shall be as the fledglings of a bird that flutter about when they are taken away from the nest. And again the prophet says, I will go before you, and level mountains, and shatter brass gates, and break iron bars in pieces. And I will give you treasures that lie in darkness, hidden, unseen, in order that they may know that I am the Lord God. And you shall dwell in a lofty cave of solid rock. And his water will never fail. You will see the king in glory, and your soul will meditate on the fear of the Lord. And again in another prophet he says, And the one who does these things will be like the tree that is planted by the streams of water, which will yield its fruit in its season, and whose leaf will not wither. And whatever that person does will prosper. Not so are the ungodly, not so. Instead they are like the dust that the wind blows from the face of the earth. Therefore the ungodly will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the counsel of the righteous, because the Lord knows the way of the righteous, and the way of the ungodly will perish. Notice how he pointed out the water and the cross together, for this is what he means. Blessed are those who, having set their hope on the cross, descend into the water, because he speaks of the reward in its season. At that time, he means, I will repay. But for now, what does he say? The leaves will not wither. By this he means that every word that comes forth from your mouth in faith and love will bring conversion and hope to many. And again in a different prophet he says, And the land of Jacob was praised more than any land. This means he is glorifying the vessel of his spirit. Then what does he say? And there was a river flowing on the right hand, and beautiful trees were rising from it, and whoever eats from them will live forever. By this he means that while we descend into the water laden with sins and dirt, we rise up bearing fruit in our heart, and with fear and hope in Jesus in our spirits. And whoever eats from these will live forever means this. Whoever, he says, hears these things spoken and believes them will live forever. Similarly, he once again gives an explanation about the cross in another prophet, who says, And when shall these things be accomplished? The Lord says, When a tree falls over and rises again, and when blood drips from a tree. Once again you have a reference about the cross, and about the one who was destined to be crucified. And again he speaks to Moses, when war was being waged against Israel by foreigners, and in order that he might remind those being attacked, that they had been handed over to death because of their sins. The Spirit says to the heart of Moses that he should make a symbol of the cross and of the one who is destined to suffer, because he is saying, unless they place their hope in him, war shall be waged against them forever. Therefore Moses piled one shield upon another in the midst of the battle, and standing high above them all, he stretched out his hands, and so Israel was again victorious. But whenever he lowered them, the men began to be killed. Why so? So that they might learn that they cannot be saved unless they place their hope in him. And again in another prophet he says, All day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient people who oppose my righteous way. Again Moses makes a symbol of Jesus, showing that he must suffer, and that the very one whom they will think they have destroyed shall give life in a sign given when Israel was falling. For the Lord caused all kinds of serpents to bite them, and they were perishing, since the fall happened through the serpent, with the help of Eve, in order that he might convince them that they were being handed over to death because of their transgression. Indeed, even though the same Moses commanded, You shall not have a cast or a carved image for your God. Nevertheless, Moses himself made one in order to show them a symbol of Jesus. So Moses made a bronze serpent and displayed it prominently, and called the people together by proclamation. When they had gathered together, they begged Moses to offer a prayer for them, so that they might be healed. But Moses said to them, Whenever, he says, one of you is bitten, let that person come to the serpent that is placed upon the wooden pole, and let that one hope and believe that though it is dead, it can nonetheless give life and that person shall be saved immediately. And so they did.
once again you have in these things the glory of Jesus, because all things are in him and for him. Again, what does Moses say to Jesus, or Joshua, for they are the same name, of none when he gave him this name, since he was a prophet, for the sole purpose that all the people might hear that the Father was revealing everything about his son Jesus? Moses said to Jesus, the son of none, when he gave him this name as he sent him to spy out the land, Take a book in your hands and write what the Lord says, that in the last days the Son of God will cut off by its roots all the house of Amalek. Observe again that it is Jesus, not a son of a man, but the Son of God, and revealed in the flesh by a symbol. Since, however, they were going to say that the Messiah is the son of David, David himself, fearing and understanding the error of sinners, prophesied, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And again Isaiah says as follows, The Lord said to the Messiah, my Lord, whose right hand I held, that the nations would obey him, and I will shatter the strength of kings. Observe how David calls him Lord, and does not call him son. Now let us see whether this people or the former people is the heir, and whether the covenant is for us or for them. Here then, what the scripture says about the people. And Isaac prayed for Rebekah his wife, for she was barren, and she conceived. Then Rebekah went off to consult the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples in your belly. One people will dominate the other, and the greater will serve the lesser. You ought to understand who Isaac represents, and who Rebekah, and concerning whom he is shown, that this people is greater than that one. And in another prophecy, Jacob speaks more clearly to Joseph, his son, saying, Behold, the Lord has not deprived me of your presence. Bring your sons to me, so that I may bless them. And he brought Ephraim and Manasseh, intending that Manasseh, because he was the older, should be blessed, for he brought him to the right hand of his father Jacob. But Jacob saw in the spirit a symbol of the people to come. And what does he say? And Jacob crossed his hands and placed his right hand on the head of Ephraim, the second and younger, and blessed him. And Joseph said to Jacob, Transfer your right hand to the head of Manasseh, for he is my firstborn son. And Jacob said to Joseph, I know, my child, I know, but the greater will serve the lesser. Yet this one too shall be blessed. Observe how by these means he has ordained that this people should be first, and heir of the covenant. Now, if in addition to this the same point is also made through Abraham, we add the final touch to our knowledge. What then does he say to Abraham when he alone believed and was established in righteousness? Behold, I have established you, Abraham, as the father of the nations who believe in God without being circumcised. Yes, indeed. But let us see if he has actually given the covenant that he swore to the fathers he would give to the people. He has indeed given it but they were not worthy to receive it because of their sins. For the prophet says, And Moses was fasting on Mount Sinai forty days and forty nights in order to receive the Lord's covenant with the people. And Moses received from the Lord the two tablets that were inscribed by the finger of the hand of the Lord in the Spirit. And when Moses received them, he began to carry them down to give to the people. And the Lord said to Moses, 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 go down quickly because your people whom you led out of the land of Egypt have broken the law. And Moses understood that once again they had made cast images for themselves, and he hurled the tablets from his hands, and the tablets of the Lord's covenant were shattered. So Moses received it, but they were not worthy. But how did we receive it? Learn. Moses received it as a servant, but the Lord himself gave it to us, so that we might become the people of inheritance by suffering for us. And he was made manifest in order that they might fill up the measure of their sins, and we might receive the covenant through the Lord Jesus who inherited it, who was prepared for this purpose, in order that by appearing in person and redeeming from darkness our hearts, which had already been paid over to death and given over to the lawlessness of error, he might establish a covenant in us by his word. For it is written how the Father commands him to redeem us from darkness and to prepare a holy people for himself. Therefore the prophet says, I, the Lord your God, have called you in righteousness, and I will grasp your hand and strengthen you, and I have given you as a covenant to the people, 
a light to the nations, to open the eyes of the blind, and to release from their shackles those who are bound, and from the prison house those who sit in darkness. We understand, therefore, from what we have been redeemed. Again the prophet says, Behold, I have established you as a light to the nations, so that you may be the means of salvation to the ends of the earth. Thus says the Lord God who redeemed you. Again the prophet says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the good news about grace to the humble. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and recovery of sight for the blind, to announce the Lord's year of favor and day of recompense, to comfort all who mourn. Furthermore, concerning the Sabbath, it is also written in the ten words that he spoke to Moses face to face on Mount Sinai, and sanctify the Lord's Sabbath with clean hands and a clean heart. And in another place he says, If my children guard the Sabbath, then I will bestow my mercy upon them. He speaks of the Sabbath at the beginning of creation, and God made the works of his hands in six days, and finished on the seventh day, and rested on it, and sanctified it. Observe, children, what he finished in six days means. It means this, that in six thousand years the Lord will bring everything to an end, for with him a day signifies a thousand years. And he himself bears me witness when he says, Behold, the day of the Lord will be as a thousand years. Therefore, children, in six days, that is, in six thousand years, everything will be brought to an end. And he rested on the seventh day. This means, when his son comes, he will destroy the time of the lawless one and will judge the ungodly, and will change the sun and the moon and the stars, and then he will truly rest on the seventh day. Furthermore, he says, you shall sanctify it with clean hands and a clean heart. If, therefore, anyone now is able, by being clean of heart, to sanctify the day that God sanctified, we have been deceived in every respect. But if that is not the case, accordingly, then, we will truly rest and sanctify it only when we ourselves will be able to do so, after being justified and receiving the promise, when lawlessness no longer exists, and all things have been made new by the Lord, then we will be able to sanctify it, because we ourselves will have been sanctified first. Finally, he says to them, I cannot stand your new moons and Sabbaths. You see what he means. It is not the present Sabbaths that are acceptable to me, but the one that I have made. On that Sabbath, after I have set everything at rest, I will create the beginning of an eighth day, which is the beginning of another world. This is why we spend the eighth day in celebration, the day on which Jesus both arose from the dead and, after appearing again, ascended into heaven. Finally, I will also speak also to you about the temple and how those wretched people went astray and set their hope on the building as though it were God's house and not on their God who created them. For they, almost like the heathen, consecrated him by means of the temple. But what does the Lord say in abolishing it? Learn, who measured heaven with the span of his hand, or the earth with his palm? Was it not I, says the Lord? Heaven is my throne, and the earth is a footstool for my feet. What kind of house could you build for me, or what place for me to rest? You know that their hope was in vain. Furthermore, again he says, Behold, those who tore down this temple will build it themselves. This is happening now. For because they went to war, it was torn down by their enemies and now the very servants of their enemies will rebuild it. Again it was revealed that the city and the temple and the people of Israel were destined to be handed over. For the scripture says, And it will happen in the last days that the Lord will hand over the sheep of the pasture, and the sheepfold and their watchtower to destruction. And it happened just as the Lord said, But let us inquire whether there is in fact a temple of God. There is, where he himself says he is building and completing it. For it is written, And it will come to pass that when the week comes to an end, God's temple will be built gloriously in the name of the Lord. I find, therefore, that there is in fact a temple. How, then, will it be built in the name of the Lord? Learn. Before we believed in God, our heart's dwelling place was corrupt and weak, truly a temple built by human hands, because it was full of idolatry and was the home of demons, for we did whatever was contrary to God but it will be built in the name of the Lord.
So pay attention in order that the Lord's temple may be built gloriously. How? Learn. By receiving the forgiveness of sins and setting our hope on the name, we became new, created again from the beginning. Consequently, God truly dwells in our dwelling place, that is, in us. How? The word of His faith, the call of His promise, the wisdom of His ordinances, the commandments of His teaching, He Himself prophesying in us, He Himself dwelling in us, opening to us who had been in bondage to death the door of the temple, which is the mouth, and granting to us repentance, He leads us into the incorruptible temple. For those who long to be saved, look not to the human speaker, but to the one who dwells and speaks in that person and are amazed by the fact that they had never before heard such words from the mouth of the speaker, nor had they themselves ever desired to hear them. This is the spiritual temple that is being built for the Lord. To the extent that it is possible to clearly explain these things to you, I hope, in accordance with my desire, that I have not omitted anything of the matters relating to salvation. For if I should write to you about things present or things to come, you would never understand because they are found in parables. So much, then, for these things. But let us move on to another lesson in teaching. There are two ways of teaching and power, one of light and one of darkness, and there is a great difference between these two ways. For over the one are stationed light-giving angels of God, but over the other are angels of Satan. And the first is Lord from eternity to eternity, while the latter is ruler of the present era of lawlessness. This, therefore, is the way of light. If any desire to make their way to the designated place, let them be diligent with respect to their works. The knowledge, then, that is given to us that we may walk in it, is as follows. You shall love the one who made you. You shall fear the one who created you. You shall glorify the one who redeemed you from death. You shall be sincere in heart and rich in spirit. You shall not associate with those who walk along the way of death. You shall hate everything that is not pleasing to God. You shall hate all hypocrisy. You must not forsake the Lord's commandments. You shall not exalt yourself, but shall be humble-minded in every respect. You shall not claim glory for yourself. You shall not hatch evil plots against your neighbor. You shall not permit your soul to become arrogant. You shall not be sexually promiscuous. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not corrupt children. The word of God shall not go forth from you among any who are unclean. You shall not show partiality when reproving someone for a transgression. Be humble, be quiet, be one who reveres the words that you have heard. You shall not hold a grudge against your brother or sister. You shall not waver with regard to your decisions. You shall not take the Lord's name in vain. You shall love your neighbor more than your own life. You shall not abort a child nor again commit infanticide. You must not withhold your hand from your son or your daughter but from their youth you shall teach them the fear of God. You must not covet your neighbor's possessions. You must not become greedy. Do not be intimately associated with the lofty, but live with the humble and righteous. Accept as good the things that happen to you, knowing that nothing transpires apart from God. You shall not be double-minded or double-tongued. Be submissive to masters in respect and fear as to a symbol of God. You must not give orders to your male slave or female servant, who hope in the same God as you, when angry, lest they cease to fear the God who is over you both, because he came to call those whom the Spirit has prepared, without regard to reputation. You shall share everything with your neighbor, and not claim that anything is your own. For if you are sharers in what is incorruptible, how much more so in corruptible things? Do not be quick to speak, for the mouth is a deadly snare. Insofar as you are able, you shall be pure for the sake of your soul. Do not be someone who stretches out the hands to receive, but withdraws them when it comes to giving. You shall love as the apple of your eye everyone who speaks the word of the Lord to you. Remember Judgment Day all night and all day, and you shall seek out on a daily basis the presence of the saints, either laboring in word and going out to encourage, and endeavoring to save a soul by the word or work with your hands for a ransom for your sins. You shall not hesitate to give, nor shall you grumble when giving, but you will know who is the good paymaster of the reward. You shall guard what you have received, neither adding nor subtracting anything. You shall utterly hate the evil one. You shall judge righteously. 
You shall not cause division, but shall make peace between those who quarrel by bringing them together. You shall confess your sins. You shall not come to prayer with an evil conscience. This is the way of light. But the way of the black one is crooked and completely cursed. For it is a way of eternal death and punishment, in which lie things that destroy men's souls. Idolatry, audacity, arrogance of power, hypocrisy, duplicity, adultery, murder, robbery, pride, transgression, deceit, malice, stubbornness, sorcery, magic art, greed, lack of fear of God. It is the way of persecutors of good, of those who hate truth, love a lie, do not know the reward of righteousness, do not adhere to what is good or to righteous judgment, who ignore the widow and the orphan, are vigilant not because of fear of God, but for what is evil, from whom gentleness and patience are far removed and distant, who love worthless things, pursue a reward, have no mercy for the poor, do not work on behalf of the oppressed, are reckless with slander, do not know the one who made them, are murderers of children, corruptors of God's creation, who turn away from someone in need, who oppress the afflicted, are advocates of the wealthy, lawless judges of the poor, utterly sinful. It is good, therefore, to learn all the Lord's righteous requirements that are written here and to walk in them. For the one who does these things will be glorified in the kingdom of God. The one who chooses their opposites will perish together with his or her works. This is why there is a resurrection. This is why there is recompense. I urge those in high positions, if you will accept some well-intentioned advice from me, you have among you those to whom you can do good. Do not fail. The day is near when everything will perish together with the evil one. The Lord and his reward is near. Again and again I urge you, be good lawgivers to one another. Continue to be faithful counselors of one another. Get rid of all hypocrisy among you. And may God, who rules over the whole world, give you wisdom, understanding, insight, and knowledge of His righteous requirements and patience. Be instructed by God, seeking out what the Lord seeks from you, and then doing it, in order that you may be saved on Judgment Day. And if there is any remembrance of what is good, remember me when you meditate on these things in order that my desire and vigilance may lead to some good result. I ask you this as a favor. As long as the good vessel is still with you, do not fail in any of these things, but seek out these things constantly, and fulfill every command, for they deserve it. For this reason I made every effort to write as well as I could in order to cheer you up. Farewell, children of love and peace. May the Lord of glory and all grace be with your spirit.